Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, brings you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Dan Daly and Dorothy McGuire in A Blueprint for Murder. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's play, A Blueprint for Murder, is a spine-tingling mystery. The thrilling drama of a romance which was overshadowed by the suspicion of murder. It's the quandary of a young man who suspects that the lovely young widow of his brother may be a diabolical poisoner. And as our stars, we have popular Dan Daly and Dorothy McGuire, creating two unusual roles in this suspenseful motion picture from 20th Century Fox. But for a moment, let's listen to Ken Carpenter. They say it's springtime that'll turn a young man's fancy to uh, thoughts of you-know-what. But I know that a really feminine-looking gal can turn a man's fancy and his head any time of the year. And there's nothing more feminine than sheer, lovely nylon stockings. And, of course, no care but Lux Flakes care for them. 96% of stocking manufacturers recommend Lux Flakes. It pays you to follow their advice because Lux Flakes care can actually double the wear you get from every pair. So always give your nylons gentle Lux Flakes care. And uh, when you're picking up Lux Flakes at the market, be sure to get the new Lux too, Lux Liquid Detergent. It's made just for the dishes job. Even though the carpenters have been using Lux Liquid for months now, I still can't get over how quickly it floats grease off plates and glasses. And so little will do so much. Just a teaspoonful does a dishpan full. While it's rough on grease, Lux Liquid is gentle on your hands. Every bit as mild as you'd expect a Lux product to be. The can it comes in is special too. It has a wonderful new dripless spout that makes it almost impossible for anyone, including me, to mess up the sides of the can. Yes, Lux Liquid is the next best thing to a dishwashing machine. As good for dishes as Lux Flakes are for nylons. If you don't agree, both are all we say. Lever Brothers will give you back whatever you paid for them. Now, Act One of A Blueprint for Murder. Starring Dan Daly as Cam and Dorothy McGuire as Lynn Cameron. The telegram was waiting for me in New Orleans. The telegram from Lynn. I took the next plane back and rushed to the hospital. Late that afternoon, the doctor was able to give us some real encouragement. And so I think our worries are over, Mr. Cameron. But she was a mighty sick little girl. You still don't know what was wrong? Not for sure. The tetany test was negative. Tetany? Those muscular spasms she was having, they're quite characteristic. Well, I'm sure she'll have quite a comfortable night. I understand you're the child's uncle, is that right? Yes, her father's dead, and my brother. I'm very attached to both children and their stepmother. Well, Mrs. Cameron's had quite an ordeal. Why not uh, take her home? uh, We'll have a special nurse on duty, and if anything at all comes up... Yes, I'll try and get her to leave now. Oh, I wouldn't think of leaving here if it weren't for Doug. Oh, poor little boy. He doesn't know what to make of all this. I'll phone him and tell him I'm coming. There's a booth down the corridor. Cam, now that you're here, how about spending a few days with us? I'd really like to, Lynn, but I should get back tomorrow. We're opening a new field in Venezuela. (laughs) You're always roaming all over the world. Did it ever occur to you that we might like to see you once in a while? It's so important to the children, especially Doug. He's never quite got over Bill's death, and he's so fond of you. Let me see what I can do. Maybe I can stay over a few days. Oh, I wish you would. Well, here's your phone booth. I'll look up a public stenographer. I got some letters and a couple of telegrams to get off. I'll meet you at the house. Wonderful. We'll expect you for dinner. And Cam, thanks for everything. Gosh, Lynn, do I have to go to bed? Can't we play just one more game? It's way past your bedtime, Doug, and tomorrow's school. But Uncle Kim's only going to be here for a few days. And we're going to have fun for those few days, too. How about the ice show tomorrow? Oh, boy. 
Gee, I wish Polly could go too. It was awful last night, Uncle Kim. The way she kept yelling, don't touch my feet. Yes, uh, I know, but I think we should try and get that out of our minds, Doug. Dad was just like that when he died. Just like that? Well, I'm afraid Doug's letting his imagination run away with him. But he was. All stiff and funny, too. Just, just the same as Polly. Is that right? Well, there was some similarity, I suppose. But the doctors all agreed that Bill had virus encephalitis. Anyway, there must be a lot of things with the same symptoms. Yes, I suppose so. Have you told Uncle Canham about your baseball team, Doug? Boy, have we got a team. I knocked two home runs last week. Uh, if we were up in Boston, Slugger, we could see the Red Sox play. Say, how about letting Doug spend the summer with me? Oh, please, Lynn, please. Well, why not? Sounds wonderful. Oh, boy. Now, uh, let's see. I've still got the sailboat out in the Cape. I don't take care of the weekends, and during the week... We... Lynn took us up to Lake George last summer, and I learned a lot about boats, Uncle Kim. Seems to me Lynn's been mighty good to you. She sure has. Well, good night, Uncle Kim. Good night, Doug. Good night, Lynn. Sleep well, dear. And just call if there's anything you want. I will. See you in the morning, Uncle Cam. You've been wonderful. The way you're bringing up those kids. They're nice kids. It hasn't been hard. When their mother died, I thought no one would ever be able to take her place. They really love you, Lynn. I don't see how they can help it. I always thought Bill was a lucky man, and now I'm beginning to realize just how... Oh, excuse me. Hello? Yes. Yes, we'll be right there. Cam, that was Dr. Stevenson at the hospital. Polly? He told us to come right over. She's had a relapse. Cam! Well, well, when did you hit town? Hello, Fred. Well, come in. Hey, Maggie, look who's here. Oh, this is wonderful. We haven't seen you in ages. Had your breakfast? Fred, uh, I've got bad news. I wouldn't be here at this hour except... It's Polly, Fred. Polly's dead. Dead? Cam? Well, of all the wonderful surprises. Take it easy, honey. Some terrible news. Little Polly Cameron. She's dead. She's what? I just can't believe it. Accident? No, no, she took sick. When, Cam, when? Early this morning at the hospital. Oh, what a tragedy. And Lynn and poor little Doug, how's he taking it? Well, they're both under sedatives. Y your breakfast, please go ahead. You'll have some coffee anyway. I'll get another cup. I have no right to barge in like this, and I should have phoned you first. That's a fine way to talk to an old friend. Fred, you're still handling the estate, aren't you? Yes, yes, of course. Cam, what was wrong with Polly? Well, the doctor seemed rather uncertain. He doesn't know? Sometimes it's hard to tell, I suppose, but there's one thing about it that bothers me. Well? Apparently, Polly had the same sort of convulsions that Bill had before he died. Cam, are you sure of that? I'm not sure of anything. I, I only know that Polly kept screaming, don't touch my feet. That's, that's very curious. I don't see anything curious about it at all. It's, it's just that I'm afraid there might be something hereditary in all this, and that it could hit Doug, too. Cam, you weren't here when Bill died, were you? No. Well, what did the doctors tell you he died from? Virus encephalitis, uh, sort of a sleeping sickness. Yet in Polly's case, they don't know? Somehow back in my mind, that don't touch my feet rings a bell. Maggie, please. She still writes for those pulp magazines. You know what an imagination she has. This has nothing to do with imagination. This was research I did at a medical library a couple of years ago. I had an idea for a story, and That's I... what I thought, a story. Well, maybe you're right. Forget it. Well, if there's something on your mind, say it. Well, I was looking up a murder case. The victim also had convulsions and kept screaming, don't touch my hand. So? He died of strychnine poisoning. Oh, Maggie, for heaven's sake, how can you even suggest such a thing? I only mean there's a, well, a similarity. You know nothing about what's happened, nothing. Maggie, don't you think the doctors would have recognized strychnine? Well, I don't know. They didn't in the case I looked it up, and they apparently don't know what killed Polly. Let's see what the encyclopedia says about convulsions. Why do you always have to dramatize everything? You're really going off the deep end, Maggie. Well, look it up if you want to. She sees a man take a pocket knife to sharpen a pencil, and right away she starts building up a murder case. Well, don't both of you jump on me. I only mentioned it as something that should be looked into. Anyway, here it is in the encyclopedia. Let me see it. Well, they, they list eight causes. Tetanus. Only tetanus would have required a cut. Obviously, it wasn't rabies. 
Epilepsy? There's no history of it in the family. With all these others, like a brain tumor, there would have been earlier indications. All except one. Well? Read it. Poisons, especially the alkaloids such as strychnine. That doesn't prove anything. No, of course not. Uh, I'd like to use your phone. I'd like to call Dr. Stevenson. <laughs> Well, we thought of the possibility of strychnine, Doctor. You're serious about this, Mrs. Sargent? I don't mean to be rude, Doctor, but you do admit you don't know what that child died from. Is this your idea, too, Mr. Cameron? I haven't any ideas, Doctor, but you told me it wasn't tetany, and yet that's what you put on the death certificate. Because that's what we were treating the patient for. She responded to the calcium, so we continued it. As a matter of fact, I suggested an autopsy. Oh? Lynn couldn't stand the idea. I agreed, and nothing could be gained by it. Mrs. Sargent, just how do you think the child got the poison? I don't know, of course, but I don't see how it could have been accidental. I hope you realize what you're saying. Meanwhile, Mr. Cameron, I'm afraid I don't want any part of all this. I'm sorry I ever mentioned it. Come on, Cam, let's go. Thank you for seeing us. You're quite welcome, Mr. Cameron. Who could have done it, Maggie? Who? Oh, several people. For instance. For instance, Lynn. Good day, Dr. Stevenson. Maggie, what's got into you making a crazy crack like that about Lynn? Now, doggone it, I'm getting mad. I only said it was possible she could have done it, and it is. Well, you've got her all wrong. She certainly made Bill a good wife. He was very happy with her. Do you plan to stay on? Till the end of the week. Just three or four days, huh? Can I drive you anywhere? No, no thanks. Think it over, Cam. It sounds ridiculous, I know. But is it? Say hello to Fred. I'll, I'll see you both in a day or two. I was with Lynn most of the next few days. More and more, I realized what a wonderful person she was. Her warmth and affection for Doug helped so much to soften the blow of his sister's death. Never did Maggie's suspicions seem more fantastic than now. Must you really leave tomorrow, Cam? I've stretched it as long as I could, Lynn. But I'll be back as soon as I can. You can rely on that. I don't know what I would have done without... Yes, Anna? It's the phone, ma'am, for Mr. Cameron. It's Mr. Sergeant. I tell him I'll call him back later, Anna. No, no, no. Go on. I'll run upstairs and see if Doug's asleep. I'll take it in the study, Anna. Yes, sir. Cam, I just wanted to know if you're still leaving in the morning. Yes, of course. Why? Well, I... I hesitate to talk about it on the phone. It's about your brother Bill's estate. Well? Under the terms of his will, Lynn shares in trust. She receives only the interest unless... Well, unless what? Now, I don't want you to think we're jumping at conclusions, Cam. We're not. It's just that I... Unless what? Unless both children were to die. Both Polly and Doug. Fred, what the devil are you trying to say? Well, it could provide a motive. I'm not amazed at you. I know how all this must sound, Cam, but I think you ought to stay over another day so we can talk it over. All right. All right, I'll see you in the morning. Cam? Anything wrong? Wrong? Oh, no, no. Fred just called to say goodbye. Oh, I hate that word. I told him he was being premature, and I've decided to stay a day or two longer. That is, if it's all right with you. You know it is. Was Doug all right? Oh, yes, thank goodness. I'm worried about him. He doesn't look at all well. It's been the same for him as for the rest of us. Mm. Such a terrible shock. No, but Doug hasn't been looking well for weeks. I'm thinking of taking him out of school camp, maybe a trip to Europe. Why? Well, he needs a change. Everything here only reminds him of his father and Polly. And it'd be good for me, too. How long would you be away? Oh, I don't know. Maybe a year or so. That long? Hmm. Might be very good for him. Visiting all the little out-of-the-way places and just taking it easy. I'm not worried about his schoolwork. He's such a bright boy. We could take some sort of study schedule with us, and that way... Be... There's no point in getting excited about it, Cam. We're just talking about it among ourselves. But I can't close my eyes to the fact that Lynn did have a motive. I don't care how it adds up. You'll never convince me that Lynn is capable of murder. 
bill left a lot of money, Cam. Almost a million dollars. And now you tell us she's thinking of taking Doug abroad. Yes, to those out-of-the-way places in Europe. Well, what do you want me to do? Be objective, that's all. Cam, I've gone through every book on poison cases I can find. There have been plenty of women who were poison murderers. Stop it, Maggie. Please. Madeline Smith, Florence Maybrick, Lydia Trueblood, dozens of others. Many of them were young, beautiful, intelligent, and cultured. You still refuse to answer a very simple question. If it was strychnine that killed Polly, why didn't the doctors recognize it? Because they weren't looking for it. Here's the dope on lots of famous poison cases. Not in one instance did a doctor call the turn based on medical diagnosis. You just can't dismiss it as impossible, that's all. At least I can't. And here's something else you might look over. This happened in Philadelphia. More than 100 people killed by arsenic before even one of the cases was suspected. Yet that's the only case reported in Philadelphia in the last 20 years. All right. How do they account for it? Because there are so many diseases, apparently, that simulate poison symptoms. And the idea of murder seems so utterly incredible to the doctors that it doesn't even enter their minds. Don't think I'm sold on this theory, Cam, because I am not. Too many things don't make sense. If Lynn were guilty, for example, she'd have had Polly's body cremated. Lynn did want Polly cremated. I talked her out of it. Bill wouldn't have wanted it. I see. I, I, I didn't know. Then Polly could have been poisoned. Cam, we, we just can't dismiss this lightly. Well, I can and I will. And if Doug should also die, Cam, then what? Doug? Would you ever be able to forgive yourself? You're a lawyer. What do you suggest? I'm afraid there's only one thing to do. Talk to the police. Get a court order for an autopsy. All right. Let's get it over with. Cam? Aren't you coming in? Dinner's ready. Hmm? Oh, oh. Well, what's the matter with you? You've been staring out of that window for half an hour. Ever since you got that phone call. Where's Doug? I told you. He's having dinner at his friends down the street. Lynn, uh, I've got to talk to you. Well, can't it wait until after dinner? No, it can't wait any longer. Lynn, I don't know how to begin. That phone call before, it, it was about Polly. Polly was poisoned. Poisoned? Yes. Oh. Why, it just couldn't be. Cam, there must be some mistake. I'm afraid not. But how? How could it have happened? The police think it was intentional. Police? Yes, it was their medical examiner who performed the autopsy. They want you and the servants down for questioning tomorrow morning. Oh, but this is impossible. It doesn't make any sense. The police, what, what gave them the idea of performing an autopsy? Lynn, you know Dr. Stevenson wasn't certain what caused Polly's death. No. Well, uh, there was a reason for thinking it, it could have been strychnine. The symptoms are almost identical. And you knew about this, and you didn't even mention it to me. I didn't think they'd find anything wrong. There was no purpose in upsetting you. I, I know it's miserable being dragged down to the police for a lot of oh, stupid questions. Oh, well, that can't be helped, but there's one fact we can't get away from. If Polly was poisoned, then somebody did it. And it's up to us to find that somebody. Yes, ma'am. I'll need your help more than ever now. I'll be here. Thank you. Before we continue with Act Two of A Blueprint for Murder, let's hear from Francis Scully. Well, I've been having spring fever, Ken, so I went to see Metro Goldwyn Mayer's romantic hit, Rhapsody. Well, I'd say that has the perfect cast for romance, Francis. Beautiful Elizabeth Taylor in Technicolor, and those two sensational screen discoveries, Vittorio Gossman and John Erickson. <laughs> yes, and in the picture, they are brilliant young musical artists. And you'll hear some of the world's greatest music. So I'm told. Doesn't Elizabeth Taylor play the role of the spoiled, willful girl they both love? That's right, Ken, in the most romantic performance of her career. The picture is in a delightfully carefree mood, and the background swiftly changes from Switzerland to Paris and the Riviera as the three young stars bring us the absorbing love story. Well, it looks like MGM has another hit for their 30th anniversary. Good night, Francis. And now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of A Blueprint for Murder. Starring Dorothy McGuire as Lynn and Dan Daly as Cam.
Lynn was questioned the following morning at police headquarters. Lieutenant Cole seemed almost apologetic. He dismissed her in a matter of moments. Then he brought Fred and me to Captain Pringle's office. Well, Lieutenant, where's Mrs. Cameron? I just let her go, Captain. She was very cooperative, but I'm afraid we didn't learn very much. Nothing from the servants either. They're all very loyal to her. What'd she have to say about them? Nothing but the best. But it all seems to boil down to Mrs. Cameron, or the cook, or the maid, or the chauffeur. They were the only ones in the house the night little girl took sick, except the little boy, of course. They had dinner at 7 o'clock. Polly took sick about 11.30, and no one admits giving her anything to eat in the meantime. Yet Strickland would have started to work in half an hour or so. Well, that's about it, I suppose. You don't sound very hopeful, do you? These poison cases are always dillies. It's going to be very tough proving anything. Now, don't get the idea we're laying down, Mr. Cameron. But there have been only two poison murder convictions in the whole city of New York in the last 50 years, both based on confessions. There's nothing else you want us for? Uh, just one thing more. We're having your brother's body exhumed, Mr. Cameron. Why do you have to do that? I think you'll agree that if we find out that he was poisoned too, it may go a long way toward helping us find the one we're looking for. He's right, Cam. You start on a case like this, and you never know where it's going to lead. We'll be in touch with you, Mr. Cameron. Thank you. Fred, where will you be late this afternoon? Maggie and I? Well, we're meeting for cocktails at the plaza. Any chance of joining us? Not for cocktails. But I may want to see you. Why? Well, I may have something. I may need some advice. <laughs> Cam, Cam, over here. Hello, Maggie. Well, I've just come from the library. Oh, no, not you, too. I went through all those books on toxicology. Lynn couldn't have done it, only now I can prove it. How? You die of strychnine during a convulsion. You die of suffocation. Well, what does that mean? It means that somebody gave Polly a second dose in the hospital. In the hospital? She was getting better. How could convulsions start all over again nearly 20 hours later? I never thought of that. No, and neither did the police or anyone else. Besides, I called the medical examiner and he had to agree. Well, of course, in all the strychnine cases we looked up, they either died in a few hours or they got well. And it proves that Lynn is absolutely innocent. But how could the hospital have given Polly strychnine? By mistake? That's what I've got to find out. I'm seeing Dr. Stevenson again in the morning. <laughs> Is Mr. Cameron, the patient's chart. The only medicines administered were all quite routine. They were supplied by our hospital pharmacy downstairs. What medicines? What was Polly given the night she died? Mm, at 10 o'clock, she was given calcium chloride pepsin in capsule form. We'd been giving her other calcium preparations, but she'd complained of the disagreeable chalky taste. So at, uh, at 6.30, I switched to these. She was given a second capsule at 10.30. Well? No ill effects indicated. She took the third capsule at half past 11. Half an hour later, the convulsion started. Could the strychnine have been in that last capsule? Well, it's possible, of course. But I'd like to remind you, it came directly from the hospital pharmacy. Well, I'm scheduled for surgery. I'd like to check with you later, if I may. Thanks. I appreciate your help. Frankly, though, I, uh, I don't know what more I can add. Cameron, you want to see me? I'm Miss Brownell. The supervisor said you're the nurse who was on duty here the night my niece died. Oh, yes, and I can't tell you how sorry... Do you recall Dr. Stevenson asking you to have a prescription filled about 6.30? Well, yes, vaguely. May I ask where you took the prescription? Well, the hospital pharmacy downstairs. They never saw that prescription. The pharmacy downstairs was, was closed. They close at 6 o'clock every night. They just told me so. Oh, of course, I remember now. I was just about to send it out when Mrs. Cameron offered to get it filled. Mrs. Cameron? Well, yes, the child's mother. I remember it very clearly now. Oh. Is that all, sir? Yes, thanks. But that wasn't all. In the morning, the police sent for the nurse. She reported to Captain Pringle's office. Now tell us, Miss Brownell. How did you happen to ask Mrs. Cameron to get the medicine? Well, I didn't ask her. The hospital pharmacy was closed, and she offered to get the prescription filled herself. 
Who delivered it to the hospital? Well, she brought it back. What time was that? Oh, I imagine about 7.30. The capsules were in a bottle? Yes. The bottle was sealed? No. No, it was just an ordinary bottle cap. And it would have been possible for someone to have tampered with the capsules without you knowing about it, huh? Well, yes, I suppose so. That'll be all, Miss Brownell. Thank you very much for coming here. Not at all. Goodbye. Who's next? Uh, Miss Cameron's chauffeur, a fellow named Wheeler. Okay, bring him in. Now then, Wheeler, you say Mrs. Cameron left the hospital just after 6.30 and you drove her to that drugstore. Yes, sir. What time did you return to the hospital? Oh, about half past seven, a little earlier, maybe. How long did it take to get it filled? Mm, ten minutes, maybe. Then you should have been back at the hospital long before 7.30. Well, on our way back, Mrs. Cameron stopped off at her apartment. Oh, why? Mm, she didn't say. How long was she there? Not very long, a few minutes. You remember if she had the bottle with her when she went up to her apartment? Well, she, uh, well, she must have. Uh, she put it in her purse. You're positive? Uh, yes, sir. That's all, Willie. You can leave now. Thanks. Yes. Well, we've seen the nurse, the chauffeur, the cook, and the maid. Only where are we? Who's waiting in your office? Uh, Mrs. Cameron, brother-in-law. That lawyer, sergeant, and sergeant's wife. Okay, we'll talk to Mrs. Cameron. Um, we'd better have a stenographer in here. Uh, that sounds encouraging. I can dream, can't I? Please sit down, Mrs. Cameron. Oh, uh, you don't mind if the stenographer takes some notes? No, not at all, Lieutenant. I want to cooperate fully. Well, first of all, Mrs. Cameron, the nurse at the hospital tells us you offered to get that prescription filled. That's right, I did. But instead of returning to the hospital, you went home? Yes. Why'd you go there, Mrs. Cameron? To pick up some things for Polly. What things? Um comb, brush, toothpaste, things like that. The night before, there wasn't time to think of anything except getting the child to the hospital. Yes, of course. Um, how long would you say you remained in your apartment? Only a few minutes. Did you open the bottle containing the capsules? No, why should I? Then you had the chauffeur drive you back to the hospital where you handed the medicine to the nurse. Is that right? Exactly. You admit handing the medicine to the nurse. Admit, that's a strange word. You realize, Mrs. Cameron, that the fatal dose was definitely administered at the hospital. That's been proved. So I understand. Well, our next step is to find out who was responsible. You and Mr. Cameron were the only visitors? That's right. You and the hospital attendants were always present while Mr. Cameron was there. I know. So that rules him out. And there was always someone present while I was there. Nevertheless, the poison was somehow slipped into the calcium capsule, and all the medicine came directly from the hospital pharmacy except the bottle you gave the nurse. Now, this bottle was in your possession when you stopped off at your apartment. This gave you the opportunity to put the poison into the capsules. What's more, Mrs. Cameron, you're the one person with a motive. I'm sure you must realize what you're saying. Yes, yes, I do. The death of the two children would make you a very wealthy woman. You wanted the child cremated. You opposed an autopsy, though there was doubt as to the cause of the child's death, and Dr. Stevenson requested it. You think I did this thing? That I killed Polly? It's beginning to look that way, Mrs. Cameron. I love that child as if she were my own. I couldn't have done it. I couldn't. I couldn't. Well, that'll be all for now, Mrs. Cameron. If you'll just wait in the other room, please. I I'd like to speak with my brother-in-law. That's where you'll find him. I'd like to speak with him alone. Very well, Mrs. Cameron. Just come with me. <laughs> They think I did it. They think I killed Polly. Yes, I, I know. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to keep calm. I mustn't get unnerved. I, I don't know how much longer I can keep this up. But I must. I, I must. Lynn. If, if things should go against me, Cam, what about Doug? From the way they talked, I may be held over for a trial or something. Well, yes, I suppose Cam, so. Cam, if it does happen, will you take Doug until it's all over? Of course. Of course I will. And try... Try not to let him ever hear about this. He mustn't know. But that day when I left police headquarters, I left with Lynn. They'd released her again, and for three more days, nothing happened. Nothing at least that we knew about. But they were very full days for the police.
checked and double-checked everything, Mr. Henderson. That's why Cole and I have come to you. We're ready to turn the case over to the district attorney's office. You know how I feel about all this. I need a lot more answers than I've got now. Maybe we can give them to you. All right. What about the other pills in that bottle? There were a dozen capsules altogether. The child was given three. She had no reaction from the first two. Third was it, Strickland. I'm talking about the other nine. Negative. Exactly. You've drawn nothing but blanks. Where would she have got the poison? In a drugstore? Not if she's half as smart as you think she is. What about the apartment? Well, insecticides. science, we've gone through it twice with experts. Same with everything in the medicine cabinets. No trace of strychnine or any other poison. Yeah. And this is the case you want us to bring before a judge and jury, huh? Yes, sir, because we know she did it. She must have done it. All right, leave everything here, all the reports. And keep digging. I can't take it to trial unless we get more evidence. Okay, okay, we'll keep trying. Nothing happened. Nothing at all. At the end of the following week, I went to the district attorney's office. I've told you a dozen times, Mr. Cameron, if we bring this woman up for preliminary examination, I'm absolutely certain no judge will hold her over for trial. Not on this evidence. You believe she's guilty, don't you? Well, what if I do? Captain Pringle does too, so does Cole. She's planning to take my nephew to Europe. Six months, a year, even five years from now, he'll suddenly die in some obscure place. You could be right, Mr. Henderson, and then by the time we hear about it, the body will have been cremated. That's all quite possible, Pringle, but it's supposition, not evidence. If there's no chance of winning the case, there's no sense bringing it into court. You mean you base your reputation on winning cases, not on losing them, so you play only the sure bet. He meant nothing of the kind. But if we don't come up with some new evidence, we're dead. So is the boy. The boy's life is in your hands. I don't appreciate your putting it quite that way. There's no other way to put it. I think there is. I think that we... Hello, this is Henderson. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay, thank you. And that was the medical examiner. There is no evidence of poison in connection with your brother's death. That at least would have been some help to us. That still doesn't alter the need of protecting my nephew. All right, Cameron, I don't like this, but under the circumstances, I suppose I have to. Pringle. Yes, sir? Get out a warrant for the arrest of Mrs. Lynn Cameron. Final act of a blueprint for murder in a moment. Now a moment with the beautiful young actress, Charlotte Austin. An extraordinary one, too. She made her debut at the advanced age of two weeks. Well, it wasn't even a walk-on part, Mr. Cummings. As a matter of fact, I don't even think I was walking at two weeks. Being the trooper you are, though, I suppose you want to tell me about a new picture of yours. Not mine, I'm sorry to say. 20th Century Fox, Cinemascope, Technicolor, The Works, but no Charlotte <laughs> Austin. You must mean Prince Valiant. A tremendous production, I hear, with a tremendous cast. James Mason, Janet Lee, Robert Wagner, and Deborah Padgett. Isn't it Hollywood's premiere on April 2nd? Uh-huh, and the New York premiere will be April 6th. Well, I guess just about everyone has read the wonderful adventure strip it's based on. Grown-ups and children alike. 20th Century Fox went all out making the picture, too. Director Henry Hathaway traveled 10,000 miles through Great Britain to find authentic locations. Well, stories about King Arthur's times will always be popular with every age group, Charlotte. So will pretty girls with pretty complexions, pretty luxe complexions like yours. Well, thank you. Janet Lee and Deborah Padgett will make you and Lux Tarlet so proud of them in Prince Variant. They're like me, you know. They wouldn't be without Lux. Nine out of ten stars depend on mild, gentle, luxe toilet soap to care for their valuable complexions. Lever Brothers will return your money if you don't think Lux is every bit as wonderful as we say it is. We pause now for station identification. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs> Curtain rises on Act Three of A Blueprint for Murder, starring Dorothy McGuire as Lynn and Dan Daly as Cam. Lynn agreed it would be better for Doug if he stayed with me until it was over. The boy and I moved in with Fred and Maggie Sargent. Then came the hearing. 
We got exactly nowhere. All the judge did was echo what the district attorney had been saying right along. The state has failed to offer any tangible proof that Mrs. Cameron put strychnine in a calcium capsule. Undeniably, Mrs. Cameron had a possible motive for such a crime, but as the defense pointed out, she's not the only one. Mr. Whitney Cameron, her brother-in-law, also stood to inherit the fortune should both the children and Mrs. Cameron die. Mrs. Cameron is a woman of high repute. Witnesses have testified that she was an affectionate and indulgent mother to both her foster children. I find that the state has failed to establish probable cause, and I hereby order the defendant discharged forthwith. That's that, Mr. Cameron. We're licked, unless we can find new evidence. Now, you spoke to her a few minutes ago, just before she left the courtroom. What'd she say? She asked about Doug. He's been with you all week, hasn't he? Yes, at Fred Sargent's house. The boy know about what's been going on? No, I, I, I told him she was called out of town, Chicago. I asked her just now if I could keep the boy until tomorrow. She agreed. I said I'd bring him home in the morning. She's pretty sore at you, huh? No, that's just it. She doesn't realize I've had any part of all this. She thinks it's been entirely a police matter. It's a tough break for all of us. I can't leave that boy in her hands. I've got to get him away, and I've only got until tomorrow. Well, just don't you do anything foolish, Mr. Cameron. Don't you do anything you'll be sorry for. The way things stand, the boy belongs with her. She has legal custody. Legal custody so she can poison him, too? You all know she's guilty. What do you do about it? You throw up your hands and offer your sympathy. Now, look, you're all upset. That's perfectly understandable. But why don't you just... just losing my mind, that's all. Now, you stop by tomorrow. You do that, Mr. Cameron. You bring your lawyer friend. Maybe... Maybe we can figure something out. All that night, I tried to think of something. Fred and Maggie, too. Some legal way of getting Doug away from her. It was no use. There just wasn't time. The next morning, I brought Doug back to Lynn. I'm sorry I've kept you waiting, Cam. I took Doug upstairs to show him some presents I brought for him. He seems so glad to get home. Yes, I'm, I'm sure he is. He was telling me all about the plans you two have been making, about spending the summer together. Yes, I'm looking forward to that as much as he is. This isn't easy to tell you, Cam, but I'm afraid we'll have to postpone it. Remember I told you I was planning a trip to Europe? Well, yes, but I've I just thought... got to get away from all this unpleasantness. You can understand that, can't you? It's all been such a nightmare. When, uh, when do you want to go? Well, I've been lucky. I've got reservations on the Victoria, and it's sailing tomorrow night. That soon? Mm. We'll probably be gone for about oh, a year. I'm planning quite an itinerary. We'll spend two or three weeks in England, and then France, Switzerland, and then if Doug wants to. I left the house a few moments later. There was only one thing left to do. I went first to the steamship office and then to one of those little stores that sells garden supplies. Well, if you're looking for something to kill the ants, I think this ought to take care of them. Uh, what is this stuff, a liquid or a paste? It's a liquid. They put honey in it to attract the ants, and then, of course, the arsenic does the rest. But if you got any children, you better be careful where you put it. Yes, yes, I will. You know, it's a funny thing. We got lots of insecticides today that don't hurt humans. But people keep on asking for these old standbys. You certainly seem to carry a variety. What are these things, these white pills? <laughs> Innocent looking, aren't they? They look like aspirin. Aspirin? <laughs> Not quite, mister. Every one of these pills is stamped with a W. There, you see? That identifies them. But what are they? Strongest stuff we ever carry. Rodenticide. Kills rats and gophers. Put out by a Midwestern concern. Arsenic? Strychnine. Enough to kill a horse. Well, good luck with the ants, mister. Come back again. When the Victoria sailed the following night, I was aboard. Doug was delighted to see me. Lynn seemed rather pleased herself after the first shock of surprise. Later, when Doug went to bed, she met me in the cocktail. I think this is wonderful, Cam. But now, really, this isn't just a sudden impulse to take a boat ride. 
dog believe me? He didn't doubt me for a moment. I'm older and wiser. Well, it's really quite simple. My firm had me down for a trip to France. I thought you said Venezuela. I felt that now was as good a time as any to make it. All right. And now the real reason. Well, standing by while you went through all this horrible ordeal was as miserable for me as it was for you. I wanted you to know that. You're making this trip just to tell me that? It isn't one of those things you can say in one night while someone's packing trunks. Not if you want to sound convincing. Oh, I see. Still don't believe me, huh? You're a hard woman. And when did you decide to come along? When you first told me you were going to Europe. Why then? Because that was the moment when I realized how much I'd miss you. I wish I could believe that. No. No, I take it back. I want to believe you can. And I do. I do. My plan couldn't have been working more smoothly. It could have been a wonderful trip if only the circumstances had been different. There were moments when I was horrified by the enormity of what I was going to do. And those terrible moments of doubt when I wonder if Lynn weren't innocent. But at the bottom of everything was the overwhelming fact that Polly had been murdered. It was our last night at sea. My time had finally run out. Where's Lynn, Uncle Cam? She's waiting for me out on deck, Doug. I told her I wanted to come down and say goodnight to you. There's a big dance in the ballroom, huh? It won't be long now before you'll be getting all dressed up and going to dances, too. You want to bet? I hate dancing. Uncle Kim, can't you stay with us in England? Oh, I'd like to, Doug, but, well, you know, I've got to earn a living, you know. Well, then when will I see you again? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'll get a chance to fly over during the summer. You promise? Okay, I promise. Oh, you'll have a wonderful time in Europe. I would if you were alone. Now, don't you worry about that. Right now, I want you to go to sleep. Okay. I'll see you in the morning before we dock. Good night, Uncle Cam. Have a good time tonight. Thanks. Good night, boy. I went to my stateroom and put it in my pocket. That small bottle that I'd filled with poison I'd bought the day before the boat had sailed. I met Lynn. I suggested a cocktail in the lounge before we went to the dance. I'd rehearsed this scene a hundred times in my mind. But now my mind was numb. The idea of taking the life of a human being was like a hideous dream. Bacardi cocktails. Remember, Cam? Remember? Oh, of course, you wouldn't. It was just that you and I first met at a cocktail party, and they served Bacardi's. But I do remember that the party was for you and Bill, mm-hmm. just before you two got married. Mm-hmm. I wish I'd met you first. I thought you were the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. Why, I can... Hey, eat. be careful. What? Oh, <laughs> no. How clumsy can oh, I get? Oh, now, don't be so upset. I've spilled a few cocktails in my time. Wait for me, will you? It won't take long to change. I'll be back in a moment. The waiter brought another drink and went back to the bar. I put my hand on the little bottle in my pocket. It would be so easy. So simple. But my hand wouldn't move. It was as if it belonged to someone else. I'd have to find another opportunity later tonight. But suppose I was wrong. But Fred agreed. And Maggie, the DA, the police, all of them agreed. Only Lynn could have done it. If I could just be certain. Lynn was back now. We drank our cocktails and went to the dance. It went on and on as if it would never end. And then suddenly... Oh, no. No what? Oh, can't you hear old Lang Syne, silly? Means the end of the dance. The end of the voyage. And it's been wonderful. Feel like walking? Hmm. How about a turn or two around the deck? I'd love to. I'd better have a wrap, though, hadn't I? Yes, you'd better. Give me a key. I'll get your coat. I knew then that I just couldn't go through with it. Out on deck, I took the bottle from my pocket and dropped it into the water. I picked up a wrap in her stateroom, and then as I was leaving, my eye caught the bright array of fancy bottles on her dressing table. Perfume, lotions. It seems crazy, but somehow I sensed an association between those bottles and the one I had thrown away. I stood there looking at them, 
They weren't all cosmetics. There were others, too. Neatly arranged in a little traveling kit. Medicines, things for first aid, and a bottle of aspirin. Suddenly, I was back in the store, and the clerk was talking to me. Aspirin? <laughs> Not quite, mister. Strongest stuff we carry. Enough to kill a horse. I opened the bottle and dumped out the pills. They were all aspirin. All except three. Three pills just a little different from any of the others. And stamped with a W. Cam, don't you think it's time to call it a night? This is the last night we'll be alone for a long time. How about a good night drink? Fine, I'd like that. Your stateroom's closer than mine. Let's go in and I'll order something from the bar. You're not drinking. What's the matter, Cam? Nothing, uh, nothing really. I Just the unhappy thought that it's all over. Oh, the trip. I'm sorry it's over too. But now tell me something and I want the truth. Why did you really take this boat? You know why? I know the reason you gave me. It's all very flattering. But it's a little difficult to believe. Why? Oh, I don't know. Of course, you are the sort of man who might do crazy, impulsive things. Like going to Europe so I could be with you for five days? Yes. Cam. Your hand, your hand's shaking. What is it? It's nothing. No, nothing's wrong. You know something? This drink tastes funny. It's, it's a bitter. Really? Mm. Uh, let me see. Mine seems all right. It's just my imagination, I suppose. No. No, not your imagination, Lynn. A few minutes ago, when I was in here getting your wrap, I found a bottle of aspirin over there. Oh? Three of the tablets in the bottle were different from the others. They had a W on them, Lynn. That's the trademark of a tablet containing strychnine. Cam, for heaven's sakes. Why were those pills different from the others? Because they were another brand. But I refuse to go through all that again. Yet they were in the same bottle. Well, why not? I'd been taking another kind of aspirin. I had a few left over, so I put them in a new bottle to save space. Is that so unusual? Lynn, the W is the trademark of a poison. Ah, so that's the real reason you came on this trip. You were behind all those ridiculous accusations from the start. You still say they were just aspirin? Of course they are. That's good. I'm relieved. I'm very relieved. Why? Because that's why your drink tastes a little peculiar. I put one of those pills in your cocktail, and you've just taken it. I don't think we have anything more to discuss. Ever. Get out, Cam. Just a moment, please. Who are you? My name's Connolly, Mrs. Cameron. I'm ship's detective. Uh, Mr. Cameron sent for me as a witness. You've been listening to us? Yeah. As a witness? So that's what you've been expecting. An hysterical admission that the pill contains strychnine. You never give up, do you, Cam? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. The, the tablet was harmless. Mr. Cameron, it seems you've made a very unfortunate mistake. If you'll excuse me, I'd like to leave. This sort of thing's getting to be a habit with him, Mr. Connolly. Connolly, wait a minute. Look at your watch, Lynn. It's been almost five minutes since you took that drink. Right now, your life can be saved, even another five minutes, but beyond that, you'll die. You know all about strychnine, don't you? Lynn, please, please. If it was strychnine, let me call a doctor before it's too late. But on the other hand, if the tablet was nothing more than aspirin, there wouldn't be much point in calling a doctor now, would there? And if I were to admit that it did contain strychnine, there still wouldn't be any sense in phoning for a doctor. It's a sort of even Stephen, isn't it? Death by strychnine or death by the electric chair. Take your choice. Lynn, it's five minutes past one. Every second is bringing you closer to a horrible death. Don't be a fool. Strange, isn't it? You seem to be the one who's going to pieces, not I. You know, it just occurred to me, if I should die, you're the one who'll be facing the electric chair. Or hadn't you thought of that? It must take nerve to kill someone, Cam, to sit by and watch someone die. How would you like to have a death on your conscience? My death. Uh, th this is too much for me. Now, did you or did you not give this woman strychnine? I gave her a pill marked with a W that I took from that bottle on the dressing table. Then it was absolutely harmless, Mr. Conley. You have nothing to worry about. Lynn, please, you don't have much time. Tell me, Mr. Conley. 
What are your impressions of this man? Would you say he had character, honor, integrity? I'm sure you would. But I'm afraid his looks are quite deceiving. Let me tell you about him. He lived in my home as a guest, as a relative, as a warm friend. But all the while he was accepting my hospitality, he was taking everything I said, every incident that occurred, and was conniving to build up a case against me. Oh, but his betrayal didn't end there. Even after the court threw out his ridiculous charges, he kept on and on. But this last attempt, this is the most contemptible of all. You must really be proud of yourself, Cam. Only nothing's happening to me. Even you ought to be convinced by now you're being an idiot, a complete idiot. You were there with me the night that Polly died. You heard her screams. You saw the horrible agony she went through. Do you think that I, that anyone who'd seen that, would take the same chance of dying in that same horrible way, do you? Well, I've been an even bigger fool than you. You took me in completely. I was even falling in love with you. All right now, get out. Get out or I'll call the person. I assure you that Mr. Cameron will leave at once. This is the most outrageous thing I've ever witnessed. You realize, Cameron, I'll have to make a full report of all this. Go ahead, make your report. I went to my stateroom. I must have been sane, blindly insane. How could I have been so wrong? Apparently, Polly's death was due to one of those impossible accidents that couldn't happen but did. A million to one shot. A mistake by a careless clerk in a drugstore. I was horror-stricken at the thought that it was only by the merest chance that I hadn't murdered her. What a mess. What a complete, miserable mess I've made of everything. I wondered if I could... Cameron! Cameron, come along, hurry. You're wanted in the surgeon's office right away. I'm Dr. Wells. Mrs. Cameron is inside. Another few moments, and it would have been too late. She phoned Dr. Wells as soon as we left. Uh, doctor, she she live? Yes, Mr. Cameron. She'll live. Lynn Cameron was convicted of murder in the first degree. Her sentence, life imprisonment. And so to the names of Madeline Smith, Florence Maybrick, and Lydia Trueblood, and all those other young, beautiful, but evil poison murderers was added that of Lynn Cameron. Something to remember? Perhaps. Doug and I, we're trying to forget. Our stars will return in a moment. Pepso Dent's new flavor. Pepso Dent's new flavor. Pepso Dent's new flavor. Wow! Pepso Dent's new flavor. And the clean mouth taste for hours. Yes, the big news is Pepso Dent has a brand new wonderful flavor. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. Please step forward, Dan Daly and Dorothy McGuire. Well, I must say you both really stepped out of character tonight to play two unusual roles. There's nothing an actress likes better than to play a part entirely different from her last one. And what was your last one, Dorothy? The part of a secretary in Three Coins in the Fountain for 20th Century Fox. It's in color and cinemascope. And Clifton Webb, Gene Peters, and I went to Italy to make it. I wonder I'm not getting anywhere in this business. All the pictures of me are made in Europe. I saw Night People, which stars Gregory Peck and Broderick Crawford. One of the most exciting fillers I ever saw. And that was filmed in Berlin. Now, why don't I get those parts? I wasn't even considered for an Academy Award this year. <laughs> what a terrible oversight. Why was that, Dad? Can't imagine, unless it's because he didn't make any pictures. <laughs> 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 
Well, I'll tell you what you do. You find a fountain, and you throw in a coin and make a wish. Now, where is he going to find a fountain around here? Never mind that. Where am I going to find a coin? <laughs> I haven't been working. You'd have me in tears if I didn't know you are going into a picture tomorrow. Oh, yeah, we're making no business like show business now. Well, it isn't the money, Irving. I just missed the love scenes with those Lux girls. It's not the real thing on radio. You know. Well, I can tell you that Lux is the real thing when it comes to complexion care. Lux soap is the favorite of our loveliest stars. Including Dorothy McGuire. I wouldn't be without it, Irving. Now I hear you have a delightful show for next week. We certainly think so. It's a charming romance and one of Paramount Pictures' most delightful screen comedies. Welcome, stranger. And we have a fascinating trio of stars. First, a brand new personality, Pat Crowley. Then, one of the most lovable character actors in Hollywood, Barry Fitzgerald. And one of the screen's most handsome comedians, Cary Grant. <laughs> it should be just great, Irving. Good night. Good, Good night. night. And all our thanks. Now here's Art Linkletter with a word for the busy housewife. When you're at the store pushing that metal cart around, have you ever noticed how many detergents there are? My gosh, you get dizzy just looking at them. So what's the poor girl to do? Try all of them? Some people do. And generally speaking, they find that a good detergent gets things clean looking and... Well, then it doesn't make any difference which one you buy. Just close oh, your eyes. Oh, wait, wait, just a minute there. Open your eyes when you buy that detergent. But when you're trying to find out if your wash is really clean, don't rely on looks alone, because your nose can tell you what your eyes can't see. Oh, you mean that things aren't really clean unless they smell clean. That's right. If things don't smell clean, they aren't as clean as they should be. And like I said, all good detergents will give you a wash that's clean looking, but Surf, all-purpose Surf, will do more. Surf gets things so clean they smell clean, too. So clean they smell like sunshine. And that means they're clean, clear through. One wash day with Surf will prove that to you. And you won't go reaching blindly for just any detergent down at the store. You'll always reach for Surf. Now remember, no matter how tough a laundry job you've got, greasy work clothes and overalls, towels, sheets, Surf gets things really clean. So get the big money saver economy sized box of Surf, because I know you'll like it. Lever Brothers Company, makers of Lux Toilet Soap and Lux Liquid Detergent, they invite you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Welcome Stranger, starring Cary Grant, Barry Fitzgerald, and Pat Crawley. This is Irving Cummings saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Heard in our cast tonight were Yvonne Patey as Maggie, Fred Mackay as Fred, Harry Scher as Doug, Jonathan Hall as Dr. Stevenson, Barney Phillips as Captain Detective Pringle, Jack Crucian as Lieutenant Detective Cole, William Conrad as the District Attorney, Joyce McCluskey as the Nurse, Herb Butterfield as the Judge, and Jimmy Eagles, Charlie Seal, John Larch, and Eddie Marr. Our radio play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was composed and directed by Rudy Schrager. Don't forget Lever Brothers' pair and a spare plan, the smart new way to buy stockings. You get three nationally advertised, first quality Canon nylon stockings, $1.85 value for just $1.